All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to an episode of A Dear Dr. Fantasy. And for my very special guest today, I have here Cla- Claudia. I should have asked you how, how to say your last name. <laughs> Jovanovic. Jovanovic. Yes. Was that good? It's, it's actually a Serbian name. It is because oh. you're now you're in Romania, I thought. but Yes. Okay. Ethnic Serb minority. Ah, okay. In in Romania. Okay. Interesting. Because it is a f- fairly diverse country. You have not just a uh, Serbian minority there. You have other minorities too, I think, right? We have a lot of minorities. I mean, just in, in my area here, we the, the province is called Banat. We have, I think, over 60 ethnicities. Wow. Okay. Pretty diverse. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And and there's a, I mean, do you then speak, I know you speak Romanian. Do you also speak uh, Serbian? Serbian is basically my mother tongue. It was the first language I ever learned. But then I, I, you know, I was, I was raised by my grandparents. My grandfather was ethnic Serb. Okay. And then I moved back to the big city and my father, he had a bone with his own father. So he decided that he doesn't want me to have any contact with the Serbian culture. I wasn't allowed to speak it anymore. Wow. I still understand most of it. And if I really have to, I can utter a few words. Okay. Interesting. I, you know, I haven't speak, spoken Serbian since I was about four or five years old. Oh, wow. Now, R- Romanian, I know, is a romance language. Mm-hmm. Romanian, um, you know, is uh, Latin was spoken in the, the Eastern Europe. Uh, there was the whole Eastern Roman Empire and all the great, I mean, a lot of history there. But it is a language, I, I would guess, without knowing much at all, that it has probably imported a lot of words from the various Slavic languages that are around it. Is that true? Slavic and Turk. We are on Turkish occupation for and what? Turkish too. 600 years. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I love languages. So yeah, it's a uh, fascinating. It's actually a very interesting and linguistically diverse part because you also have Hungarian there, which is not a Slavic language. Um, so it's a Finno-Ugric language, I believe, right? Um, so you've got a lot of different languages in that area too, don't you? Ha. Huh. Very cool. So anyway, we weren't we're we're here to talk about fantasy and books and stuff, but this all just came up, so that's great. Um now. I should tell my viewers right away that Claudia, if you don't know her, is a big time Malazan fan. And her channel is a treasure trove of interviews with Steven Erickson. Uh, and so if you're at all, you know, interested in some very cool interviews with the author, you're you're probably going to want to be a reader of the series because I know you, you're going book by book, though. Right. So. Yes. So you could go and watch if you wanted to, if you've read Gardens of the Moon, for example, but nothing else. I think you 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 could go and watch that those videos, or would you want to have somebody finish Malazan Book of the Fallen? Probably. Be- oh man. One sec. This is not oh, okay. All right. So so how uh, would you would, would you advise people who haven't read the whole series to to watch the earlier videos or the interviews or not? Better to for people to have read the entire series because the purpose of the interviews is to connect different points of the plot and where foreshadowing follows and you know just connecting things so it's it's best if if people know people have read this whole series before okay to watch your interviews with steven erickson now that's just malazan book of the fallen you don't do spoilers for any of the other series or do you actually do like spoil carcanus and the, the entire malazan universe nothing okay. is safe from spoilers <laughs> <laughs> okay, just as a warning, if you go and watch the interviews, you probably will get spoiled if you haven't read all the series, correct? Sure. Okay, that's that's a nice, that's fair warning. So it really is a very Malazan focused uh, 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 place, but you also are reading other fantasy, aren't you? Sure. Yeah. So I know you just said to me before we started recording, you're reading The Faithful and the Fallen by John Gwynn right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so how far are you into that? I'm halfway into Ruin, so. Oh, okay. Ruin was where I felt like the story really got elevated. The writing got elevated. I felt like John Gwynn, wow, okay. He has really started to 
to delve further into the craft of writing here. And I, I really enjoyed Ruin. I think it's my favorite of the four, although Wrath is a fantastic finish as well. Um, so yeah, good stuff. Uh, nice. Are you enjoying The Faithful and the Fallen so far? Yes, I, I find it really awesome. I mean, I, I know that Abercrombie is usually a fan favorite, but for me personally, I've enjoyed this series a lot more than what I've read of Abercrombie. Interesting, interesting. And how much of Abercrombie's uh, First Law series have you read? Just the First Law series, and I think the first of the novels after that. Okay, so it's just the first trilogy, and then Mm -hmm. one of the standalones. Mm -hmm. Okay, Uh, do you know which standalone it was, or? Uh, Best best Served Cold? Yes, Best Served Cold. Okay, yes. Yeah, okay. I, I, I love everything First Law myself, and I'm excited by the fact that apparently they're making Best Served Cold into a film which I think would be an ideal uh, medium for that particular story. Uh, and Joe Abercrombie is involved uh, to some degree in the uh, screenplay, I believe. So it's, I think a lot of us are very excited about that. Um, I so, agree. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Any, well, you know what? I think, so we've given people, uh, now, are you going to do other things on your channel or do you want to keep it to pretty much those interviews with Steven Erickson? Um, what, what, do you, what are your thoughts on what you'd like to do with your channel? Because well, It's probably going to be just Malazan books. I'm hoping that maybe someday Asselmont is going to join in, in, in the interviews. Hoping. Nothing yeah. confirmed, but would be nice. Yeah. To be honest, I'm not very good at talking by myself to a camera, so... Uh-huh. Unless I have somebody to talk to, it gets a little difficult. I, I totally understand that. I, I prefer the conversations over just trying to be in, interesting and engaging by myself, talking to a camera. It, it's it's a harder thing for me to do, for sure. So You're good at it. Yeah. Well, I try. <laughs> I mean, I do have I do have had practice uh, teaching in, in the classroom. So maybe that helps me a little bit. I don't know. Um, but but anyway, yeah. So speaking of Esamont, we are going to talk. I'm going to warn people because later in the video and we will warn you when we're going to talk spoilers because we don't usually do spoilers here on Dear Doctor Fantasy. But Claudia and I really, really, really want to talk about Forge of the High Mage and also some broader stuff with the Malazan series. Uh, so we are going to do that, but that will involve spoilers. So I will warn you if you haven't read Forge of the High Mage or if you're not a, a pretty well-read Malazan reader when we're going to talk about all that stuff. So just that, but we're going to talk other stuff first. So <laughs> including my standard question for you, Claudia, which is going on the theory that you are what you read, which is my theory. <laughs> <laughs> What are some of the formative stories in your life? What are some of the reads that you would consider to be really important in the making of who you are today? Going back as far as you want, you can go back to your childhood if you wish. I am fascinated to hear your answer because of where you're from and and the the various uh, languages that you're familiar with, so. Well, Definitely, the Malazan story has been the most significant literary ex- literary experience of my life. Yeah, and I would tend to agree that it's probably not the most suited read for young people. Uh-huh. I think it requires a certain level of life experience in order to be able to feel not understand intellectually, but process emotion emotionally certain experiences. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's very well said, actually, um, because uh, unfortunately, I think there's this idea out there that, oh, you have to be really smart to read Malazan. I don't think so, actually. I, I don't I don't think that's what it is. I think it's a series that offers so much on so many levels, including emotionally. Um, it, and there are some things that happen in the course of, of the, all the series, but um, that are you you would want someone to have some life experience to be able to process some of those things i think so that's really well said yeah uh so malazan when when did you first read the series in i think at the end of 2016 i started with it and i think within 10 months i had read everything the 10 10 books asselmont's novels and i think by then i had uh, Forge of Darkness and Fall of Light. Wow. 
That's awesome. Yeah. So you've read everything Malazan at this point. You're yes. all caught up. The Bocalane and Corbel Brooch novellas. Everything. Uh, everything. And including the ones that Steven Erickson put on Facebook. The, uh, the no, novellas. That one not yet. I still have it saved as PDF pages. Yeah. And I have to remind my husband <laughs> to put it in a proper format so I can start reading it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I, I don't count that. I, I say I've read everything Malazan that's been published. So, uh, you know, uh, I haven't read that that novella either myself. Um, I'd like to. I, uh, I think in it, it, is, is it the one where he uh, includes a character that is has a name that is based on Joe Abercrombie? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so, yeah, a couple people we know have been. Uh, put into Bocalane and Corbel Brooch novellas, including Mr. A.P. Canavan. Uh, so, <laughs> so he appears uh, as uh, Apto Canavalian in there. Uh, so that I just love reading uh, the two that where where Apto appears. Uh, I, I get laughs just thinking about it. <laughs> Cracked Book Trail is probably where Erickson is at his best. It's brilliant stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's really brilliant satire and, and uh, um, absurdist humor and all kinds of stuff. So um, yeah, it, it's fun to read. And of course, it's a meta commentary on the act of, of writing and the reception that writers get and uh, the interactions between writers and critics and all kinds of other things. So yeah, it's good stuff, isn't it? So yeah. Let's let's uh, talk for a little bit then, because Malazan was the first thing that came out of your mouth, uh, which is, you know, that's that's good. Uh, I like that. Um, and you said you, you read it back in 2016. Yes. And how did you get to the point where you were able to reach out to Steven Erickson and say, hey, I want to do a bunch of interviews with you and talking about your books and he said, sure. And you guys have had these really awesome interviews that go into such detail about the books. How did that happen? How did that come about? Well, I think that being very passionate and in everybody's face on the Malazan Empire group on Facebook probably caught his attention. Uh -huh. I mean, I've been there very active for a very long time. And then he came to Croatia for an event in Opatio. Uh -huh. Okay. And I thought, okay, this is as close to my area that he's ever going to be. Yeah. So I made my husband take a, 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 a vacation to Croatia that year. You have a very nice husband. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, <laughs> I think you know, on that account, he wouldn't have had much, much choice. <laughs> I was excited out of my mind. I am going to see this man. And I think I, I kept telling to myself, so what are you going to do? I mean, he's going to sign your book for maybe 10, 15 seconds and that's it. Yeah. And then as faith would have it, he replied to a comment of mine on, I think on his author page. Uh -huh. And of course I felt God touched. <laughs> he, he responded to my comment, you know, uh -huh. it's, uh -huh. it's something. And my, I told him I was I was going to be in Opati. I said, sure, let's you know have a drink, discuss for a while. And then there I was at the festival, and he was just sitting at a table with a friend of his having a conversation. So I said, okay, Klau, put your big girl pants on, go say hi to him. <laughs> <laughs> so I just went to him. I asked him if he's Steve, Steve Nerson. I already knew that, but, you know, I had to break the ice. So. Yeah. And then we spoke for a while, and eventually he added me as a as a friend on facebook uh -huh. and then one day i thought why not i mean i i had seen an interview of him with some other girl i think um uh, brandy was her name not sure hmm. anymore it, it's been a while uh, a while and i thought i can do this i mean why not i mean everybody i've, I've seen so many interviews with him everybody focuses on What's his technique for writing? What's his source of inspiration? What's the history behind the games? But there aren't any interviews based on the lore, on the characters, on on the universe itself. Mm. I'm so passionate by this aspect of the books. I thought, you know, I could do this. So one day I just wrote to him and I asked him if he would be all right with having interviews. He said, yes, sure. Let's give it a try. And that's how it happened. Brilliant. Yeah. Good for you putting your big girl pants on like that. 
<laughs> That's great. I love it. I had a brain freeze after that. Uh -huh. and I, I had all of these questions that I was going to ask him and a big plan. And then I was oh, sure. there at the table and my mouth wouldn't open. I swear <laughs> it just clenched. My brain was empty. Yeah. He started to talk to my husband and I was so jealous. Why is he talking oh. to him? I should be the one <laughs> talking to Steve, not him. <laughs> that's funny. Oh, yeah. no. Well, yeah. you've had plenty of chances to talk since, and that's really fantastic. Um, and we're glad those videos are out there, those interviews. But was Malazan the first fantasy series you ever read, or were there other previous ones that were that that helped you? I had read Game of Thrones in English for the first for the first time. Okay. And I think that was my first fantasy series ever. I guess I've always been a fan of fantasy, but growing up in communist Romania, that wasn't very much available. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And as I think I was eight or nine years old when I started reading novels, my my father used to call me a library rat because I would go through books really, really fast. We had a big library at home. Uh-huh. He introduced me first to the... Um, Greek myths, Legends of Olympus. Oh, nice. Yeah. And from there, some Romanian literature, and then Alexandre Dumas. Uh -huh. He probably wrote almost everything he wrote. And yeah. a lot of Jules Verne's as well. Okay. All right. So those are definitely authors who stretch the imagination, I would say. Yeah. A little bit of Mark Twain. Uh -huh. I really loved uh, the Connecticut uh, Connecticut Yankee at King Arthur's Court, but yeah. I read it in Romanian. I've recently ordered it in English. I want to see how how it feels in its original flavor. Uh huh. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that's uh, Mark Twain fantasy right there. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. Interesting. Yeah. Great. So those were all kind of things that you read before Malaz and and you. Be during my teenage years, I'd guess. Uh huh. Okay. okay. And then you know. There were certain events in my life. I I took a break from reading for a few years. Mm -hmm. And then fantasy started popping up all over TV. Yeah. And I remember thinking, man, I really wish I could read those books. Until eventually I thought, damn, you're so dumb. If you really want to read them, why not buy the books and read them? It's that simple. Yeah. And since then, I've, I've been on my on my path back again and I've decided fantasy only I mean it's why what my soul craves there's a lot of literature out there yeah too much for one single person to read everything in every oh, genre tell me about so, it yeah. <laughs> yeah so fantasy it is wonderful wonderful yeah and you, and you found a home there with some really great authors I would say uh so yeah it sounds like because I'm curious about what make somebody receptive or open to Malazan. And it's for me, it's a very special series uh, because it does a lot of things that typical fantasy doesn't do. And I, I think that sometimes fantasy fans have, interestingly, uh, a hard time with the series initially because it does the unexpected and it subverts things. Whereas I feel like people who aren't necessarily hardcore fantasy fans might have an advantage in a way starting Malazan uh, because they don't have the same expectations. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I was saying no. the same thing that maybe the fact that I haven't read fantasy, well, with the exception of Game of Thrones, I hadn't read any fantasy and right. I just went there with an open mind, whatever I find, that's what it is. Yeah. I think that's the best way to read Malazan actually is come in with an open mind, be willing to be uh, flexible, open. It's Again, I don't think it's about intelligence. It's really more about being receptive and and uh, willing to roll with what comes, you know? Um, and I wasn't initially like that. I was a fairly well-read fantasy reader. And I was a major Tolkien fan. And so I had expectations going in. I initially was like, what is going on here? I know that he's subverting stuff and he's doing something different, I think. And I had not, the only thing I knew about Malazan uh, going in was that it was considered one of the great fantasy reads by many people. And I wanted to expand my fantasy reading at the time. So that's why I went in and read it. And I had no one to talk to about it. I never saw anything about, I just got the, the 10 books and, and read them, you know, and 
Um, so glad I did because I realized this is something different. This is, I read it the first time before I started my channel. And one of the reasons, one of the, uh, the impetus behind my channel was I wanted to talk about fantasy that I think is really uh, conducive to critical exploration. And this was one of the series where I thought, oh my goodness, there's so much you could say about this series, but I need to reread this one because I read it and I got through it and I loved it. But there's so many things that I feel like I didn't quite grasp or that I could go deeper with. And so this was a series I knew I was going to reread on my channel. And as fate would have it, I lucked out big time uh, getting to do the reread with AP uh, and discuss the series uh, with him and, and occasionally with Steven Erickson and Ian Esselmont because we did uh, the novels of the Malazan Empire concurrently. So, wow, you know, what a what a great journey. And for me, Malazan has been the uh, the greatest literary journey I've ever been on, um, and you, especially when you put all the books in there. So, yeah. Would you describe it that way, too? Definitely. Without without hesitation. I think one thing that makes it difficult for readers to to follow the book, or possibly the reason why everybody says you have to be smart to read Malazan, uh -huh. is the fact that it's it it requires a lot of say detective work. You have to connect a little one sentence from the first book with something that happens in the fifth book, and uh -huh. it, it's about remembering all these things. It's vast, it's big, it's, it's, the scale is big and it's intricate yeah. in some ways, but I don't think that is a matter of intelligence. Uh, no, it's, it's a matter of preference. Yeah. People make it about intelligence, but I think it's just a matter of about preference. If you yeah. enjoy that sort of thing, it's fun. If you don't, it's tiring. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it, I think, I, I wish somebody, I, I had known somebody when I read it the first time to tell me, just relax, buddy. You you don't have to memorize every name. You don't have to keep looking at the map to, you know, okay, there's where we are. And, you know, you don't have to master everything the first time, just relax and enjoy the experience. I wish somebody had been there to, to give me that advice the first time I read it. Uh, but I was able the second time to just relax and and, and be in the story and not continuously push myself out of the story by looking at the the character, uh, the dramatis personae and all that stuff. Uh, so so I, 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 while I loved it the first time, the second time was uh, just such a profound experience, uh, such a moving experience. Uh, also one of the most emotionally impactful things I've ever gone through. Um, so yeah, awesome. Well the first time around I used to go through it and I would see this little sentence or a little paragraph and think, this is important. He's trying to tell me something that is what? connected somehow to something else, but I don't have what it takes to understand it now. And it made me remember of, remember something my grandfather used to tell me whenever I would come to him with a uncomfortable question, like, you know, where do children come from? He'd say, someday you'll be big enough to understand. Mm. And I used to have this long list of questions that I would have to understand when I'm older. Yeah, I think I, I had the same approach with Malazan. Just remember this until the moment when you're old enough to understand. So yeah. remembering all of these little details until such point where they finally fall into the frame, it's probably what makes it difficult for people because everybody wants to understand what they're reading. Um, reading and not being to understand what's going on can be frustrating uh-huh so yeah. in a big way I, yeah. I, I think that's what makes it difficult for people because most people don't focus on these details or if they see them they throw them in a corner of their mind and they don't re recuperate them when they I don't know three books later they come over this over the same detail yeah yeah I think that for, for people who enjoy this sort of reading it's quite a pleasant experience Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. You said that uh, you met him in Croatia. Uh, which uh, which city were was it? Opatia. Okay, I haven't been. I've been to Dubrovnik myself, which is gorgeous. Have you been to Dubrovnik? No. Oh, okay. Oh, it's so nice. Um, and interestingly, you mentioned uh, you. So you watched the the, the HBO series uh, Game of Thrones as well as reading the books. Yes. Okay. 
so I think that uh, some of the um, one of the locations for King's Landing actually was filmed in Dubrovnik, I believe, at least in part, um, which I find pretty cool. It's a it's a wonderful location. In fact, I went there myself before the uh, HBO TV series, um, and uh, it's uh, it actually inspired one of the cities that I write about in my books. Um, so. Kiriath in Astrolad is, though the culture is more South Asian, the the look of Dubrovnik actually had some influence on the way I wrote that that particular city. Uh, so that's one you see a little bit in the first book, but you see more of in the second book. Um, uh, but it's a beautiful location, um, and it, it's it's an interesting thing how it does seem that there are real world places that inspire fantasy places. So like you could talk about Darujistan, for example, you know, in Malazan, and you can point to certain places in the real world that evoke the same or a similar kind of feeling, right? Um, so what do you think about the relationship between the real world and the fantastic that is portrayed and, and how um, writers like Steven Erickson and, and, and many, many others can take from the real world, but in the process um, of creating this secondary world, this other world, uh, it allows them to do things that we don't have here, but at the same time, it's grounded in what we have here, if you see my meaning. Um, it, I think it's unavoidable. I uh -huh. mean, this is where we live. Based on the experiences we have, we draw. Um, my husband, he he's also talented with uh, drawing and painting and the likes. So oh, nice. I think he, he tells me sometimes that he goes through the city, be it this city or any other city, and he looks at things and in his mind, there are layers and layers and layers and the place changes into something else. As wow. he walks, he sees the city different and he imagines stories. He imagines something else layered on top of the reality. There are people who I think have this gift. I think I saw um, an essay of Erickson once and he was talking about the importance of boredom hmm. and how boredom forces people, children in particular, who are still forming their, their personality and their intellect, yeah. forces them to, to fantasize, to think, to create. And he had this example of being a child running riding a bicycle through a forest and he would imagine dragons and all sorts of things as he was riding his bike. So I think it's I it's something it. that, you know, some people have the ability to create a different reality in order to improve on their boredom or on the on a reality that they dislike. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I I um spent my most of my teen years in Vermont where I was born and had by then read uh, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and everything else Tolkien because I got pretty obsessed uh, with with uh, Middle Earth and all that and I can distinctly recall I used to love to go for walks because we live in a very rural area where I'd go back we live in a log cabin um, heated by a wood stove and uh, would go out the back door and there was a forest and I could just go in that forest. There were some trails and, and walk for hours and never see another soul. But I always wanted, to, it, it sounds silly, but I always kind of, there was a part of me that wished to meet elves in that forest. <laughs> There's nothing silly about it. Right? I mean, there. I'm longing for something. There's this thing about being human, I think, that we're always longing for something just over the horizon. And if, if we feel like if we could just grasp this thing, that we would have some kind of enlightenment. Um, and I always felt like maybe there's an elf hiding behind that beautiful old tree over there. You know, I just, I longed to meet elves in that forest as a young teenager. Um, but you see, well, go ahead. For me as a child, it was a fairy wand. Uh huh. I really, really believe that maybe this next stick is going to be a fairy one that I could, maybe I could meet a fairy, have my three wishes, you know? Yeah, yeah. 
why do we ha- why do we why are we built that way and i don't know it, are all people like that on some level and do when we grow up we just sort of suppress that longing and and think of it as childish or uh or there's just some people who have that 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 sense of uh of wonder because there are many people who don't read fantasy and think it's silly and, and childish. Um, I wonder if they have killed their sense of wonder as, as adults. Um, and if, if they hadn't done that, if they would feel similarly, what do you think? I think we all have it to a point, but some of us have it more than others. Okay. Yeah. And I, I think the artistic types, the creative types, we have it more than, than people who are perhaps, you know, ground in reality or, you know, more, more, actually more reality oriented. My uh-huh. sister, she, she hates fantasy. She, she thinks it's, it's silly. Okay. Huh. Interesting. And science fiction. She can't stand it. Huh. Because it's not grounded in reality or, okay. Does she read at all? Does she like other kinds of genres and stuff or? I don't think she reads much for pleasure. She reads uh-huh. psychology stuff related you know professional stuff okay okay um maybe romantic comedies that sort of stuff you know okay. romance books but nothing much okay. else because i've definitely met people who don't read they're not they don't read fiction they don't read stories and, and they're like why do you do that you know what what's you're wasting your time you know what why do and for me i just it's like eating it's like sleeping i need that and i feel like to make sense of the world I live in, I need stories and and to process my life and to feel a sense of catharsis and and to connect with people, because that's one thing fantasy is brilliant at is helping me to feel a sense of connection with other people. That's Malazan is one of the best series, and that's why one of the reasons why I love it so much is Malazan helps me to feel that connection with people. Um, and I'm not saying you need to engage with stories to feel connected with other people, but for me, that's one of the main ways in which I feel connected to other people is by engaging in stories. Um, so it's interesting to me that why why do some people maintain that sense of wonder as adults and engage in this kind of storytelling that we call fantasy, which, by the way, is the oldest form of storytelling there is. Although you will find people, you know, going back millennia who were not fans of fantasy, right? So you'll have like Plato, for example, uh, accusing Homer of being a liar, you know, um, and and misleading people with those silly stories and that sort of thing. Well, um, I, I can agree with him to a point since uh-huh. for them it wasn't just storytelling it wasn't just mythology it was also religion so when you create a story about the gods that people worship Mm -hmm. then you know worshiping is something real people who believe take it as reality if somebody now came with a story about christ and how he's walking the earth right now i don't know something related to christianity and Uh it would claim it to be real any faithful would say, well, how do you have this information? Right, right. It's interesting to me because I do often wonder how much did ancient people believe that their myths were literal truth or were they, are we not giving them enough credit? Were they intelligent enough to realize actually these stories emerged from uh, a sort of whimsical uh, creative way of explaining the world and they understood their metaphors that there's no dude up there in the clouds who's throwing lightning at everybody uh, it's a metaphor and uh, so I do wonder how many people and, and when these stories originated I suspect strongly that the people telling the stories and hearing the stories knew that they weren't literally true but that they were they had they had uh, uh, kind of a capital T truth embedded in them in a way that they're they're getting at big truths with all these little lies. That's what storytelling can do. Whereas maybe later, the, as these stories got repeated and passed down generations, maybe later generations, I don't know, took them as literal truth, uh, perhaps. 
But to me, and when you when you freeze the, the metaphor and you say, no, this is literally true, you've killed the story in a sense. Um, you've fossilized it. It's not a living thing anymore that, that people engage in. That's at least that, that's how I feel. Um, when you when you take a, a beautiful old story like that and you say, no, this literally happened. You you sucked that's all the, the wonder out of it. That's the difference between storytelling and religion. Oh. I mean, based based on the way that religious people today in in all religions look at it, I I'll, I'll just look at at uh, Hinduism because it's probably the most diverse in in storytelling and fantasy religion oh, that that's... exists today. Yeah, my husband is a Hindu. His family oh. is very religious. For them, all those stories are literal truth. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt, no metaphor. Right. The, so, the Ramayan actually happened. It, it's the same for Mahabharata. Christians I know who are very faithful. Exactly. Right. It happened literally. In Christianity, at least, there's a tendency to give space a little bit to metaphor. Perhaps like the creation of, of the world. Maybe it wasn't one day. Maybe one day is a metaphor for, I don't know, a million years. Mm-hmm. But that's to only certain people. Some will yeah. Make it oh no, I I know world. I know people who are would fit the label fundamentalists who would say no. If it says six days, that's what it was. You know, that's it. End of it. You know, there's no debate. Right. <laughs> there's no metaphor there. Um, so yeah, you'll find that I think in every religion, people who take it more literally, and then people who are more like, yeah, this there's some truth here maybe in this, but it's not necessarily literal. It's, I think it's also cultural because yeah. the trust that Christianity has on people has weakened over the last 100 years or so. Mm -hmm. It's not the same with maybe Islam and Hinduism, where people are more more religious, I would say, than, than we are overall. Uh -huh. Not individuals, but overall as societies. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to compare. I mean, I actually have lived in South Asia and traveled all over India and I lived in Nepal and I've. I too am married to someone who grew up Hindu, uh, so I have some uh, some insight into it as well. Um, I would say most of the people I know are not fundamentalist Hindus. In other words, they don't think the Mahabharata happened just the way it's described. And, and by the way, which version are we talking about here, right? Um, so uh, they don't necessarily treat their religion in a way that's literal um the majority that i know but there definitely are people who think no this is actually exactly what happened as described um so i, I i've just found i found a diversity of people everywhere um the percentages may vary you know um but my, my husband doesn't take it literal he's not actually very religious at all he's uh -huh. most likely agnostic even though he was raised to be hindu Right. And that has led to some conflict between him and his family because his mm -hmm. family are quite fundamentalists. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that somebody who's willing to marry outside of their own culture and religion has already kind of, you know, made a, a, a decision to, to, to stray in a way, I suppose. Uh, so, <laughs> but, but it's fascinating to me. It is fascinating to me how, uh, and there's something I'll never stop thinking about. And it's something that's woven into my own storytelling as well, because I, I definitely grew up in a religious household. I'm the son of a minister, grandson of a minister and great grandson of a minister. So uh, Christianity was per pervasive for me growing up. I read the Bible every day. I've read it many, many times, uh, both the Hebrew portions and the Greek portions. Uh, so, and there's a bit of Aramaic in there too. Uh, so yeah, I, I can't read it in any of the original languages. Uh, I don't know them, but uh, I've read the translated version many, many times. And I've evolved in the way I feel about that religion throughout the course of my life. Um, you know, I've, I, I do not participate uh, in an organized religion today. Um, but I still have a lot of, I feel, uh, affection, uh, for what I grew up in and, and respect, I hope. Um, but it fascinates me how people approach these things in different ways, which is one of the reasons why I love Malazan, because you can, especially Esamon actually deals with the theme of religion in there a lot, um, and, and in Forge of the High Mage too. <laughs> Um, but, uh, it's fascinating. I mean, it just seems like it's such a, 
big part of human experience. And that sense of wonder, that sense of the numinous we were talking about earlier, I feel like that is something beautiful about many religions when that is incorporated into someone's religious outlook, that the religion becomes an expression of that longing. And, you know, that, that can be a beautiful thing, I think. So, uh, so um, what, uh, did you feel like this would be a good time since I just mentioned Forge of the High Mage for us to get into our spoiler discussion? So a couple things I want to, if you, viewers, if you uh, have not yet read uh, Forge of the High Mage or most of the Malazan books, this is your warning. We are going to talk about uh, spoilers. Probably let's start though with the Malazan's more general topic. And then we can go into Forge of the High Mage, which probably fewer people have read that because it is not out here in the States yet. Um, we have to wait till next year or something. I, I do not understand why publishers do that, but but. Anyway, you wanted to talk about something specific about Malazan, right? Oh, yes. This is actually something that's been on my mind for quite a while. And I was just going through Dust of Dreams. My husband, he's also trying to read the books and we read together. He reads aloud and I follow what he, what he reads. And every now and then we stop, we discuss. I've actually been working like functioning like a guide for him. Huh. And there's this fragment in Dust of Dreams where Sam Churok, he, the, the Kel Hunter, he talks to Caliph. Let me see, maybe I have it here. He talks about basically the need for balance of, of the fact that there can be no two gods. And he talks about magic. And there's no, maybe just one sentence, but it fits. He says, the exchange Hamal resumed. In its knowledge, the God would understand the necessity for that which lies outside itself, beyond its direct control. In that tension, meaning will be found. In that struggle, value is born. If it suits you and your kind, Astrian, fill, fill the ether with gods, goddesses, first heroes, spirits, and demons. Kneel to one or many, but never, never, Caliph, hold to a belief that but one God exists, that all that, it is, all that is resides within that God. Should you hold such a belief, then by every path of reasoning that follows, you cannot but conclude that your God is cursed, a thing of impossible aspirations and deafening injustice, whimsical in its cruelty, blind to mercy and devoid of pity. Do not misunderstand me. Choose to live within one God as you like. But in so doing, be certain to acknowledge that there is an other, an existence beyond your God. Mm. And if your God has a face, then so too does that other. In such comprehension, Destrian, will you come to grasp the freedom that lies at the heart of all life? That choice is the singular moral act, and all one chooses can only be considered in a moral context if that choice is free. We are reviled for revealing the face of that other God, that God of negation. Hmm. Your kind have a flawed notion of magic. You cut the veins of other worlds and drink of the blood, and this is your sorcery. But you do not understand. All life is sorcery. In its very essence, the soul is magical, and each process of chemistry, of obeisance and cooperation, of surrender and of struggle, at every scale conceiv conceivable, is a consort of sorcery. Hmm. Destroy magic, and you destroy life. The last part, I, I found it to be significant with regards to the imposition of order upon chaos. It, the concept in the books sounds so very, you know, like, like a deep folklore, some sort of obscure legend in the world, in the history of the world, but I think it drives the entire magic system. Yeah. I remember thinking at some point that if there's a constant war between chaos and order, and order is being imposed on chaos, then chaos must be imposed on order as well. Yes. And then I realized that's not quite true. Mm. You know, if, if I was to use a metaphor to, to explain it, I would compare it probably to soup or broth. You yeah. have a large quantity of water and only a little bit of salt. And that's what creation is. A lot of chaos and just a little bit of order. Uh-huh. The, the, how did I reach to the, the, this conclusion? We know that chaos 
is magic. Chaos is the source of all magic. Right. And if all life, creation itself, is magic, like Samcharok just explained, every chemical reaction, every, every, everything that is creation, everything that is alive is magic. Mm -hmm. It's not just the dragons and the Azathanaya and the heroes, not only the people who can draw upon magic that are magical, but everything, the animals, the people, the grass, everything is magic. And if chaos is magic, then life itself is chaos. With a little bit of water imposed on it. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so, I love it. So, yeah. For a soup to be edible, you, know, you need a certain quantity of salt. If you add too much, it's done. You cannot eat it anymore. Mm -hmm. so, same is for creation. You can only have this much order before everything falls apart. In, in a way, chaos is magic and magic is life, like he just said. So living itself is chaos. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if, if you think of dragons, they are basically the first iteration of chaos. They are chaos made manifest. Mm -hmm. That's why they cannot control themselves. That's why they war with each other. That's why they, they are the way they are. I would hazard to say that the Azathanai, they are probably the first iteration of order imposed on chaos. They are mm -hmm. just as powerful as, as dragons. They have access to every type of magic they want. But they are controlled. They are reasonable. They are rational. They're not like the dragons. Now, I know we think of, of the Azathanai as being expected, but I think it's different than expectations expectation for the elder races or perhaps for humans or for ascendants. Mm. But then it's more a, cho a matter of choice, of preference. I mean, we see Bug healing Tehol using Haidenul, but he's the god of seeds. Yeah. Which means he has access to, to more than, than just his aspect. But I think the biggest proof of the fact that expectation is a choice for the Azathanai is Krul himself. Mm. He's the same race as everybody else. He's no different. Yeah. You know, we think of, of the Warrens and of, of aspects as being different types of magic, but they're just, they're described as flavors. Flavors of what? Flavors of chaos. Uh -huh. So if they have chaos in their blood, that means they have in their blood is the the ability to use any kind of magic. Right. Which explains why when Krul opens his veins, people can draw on whatever they want to draw. Now, yeah. people are not as powerful. They cannot draw on chaos itself on any aspect. But within Krul, within every Azathanai, is the blood of chaos, is the very manifestation of magic. Yep. So I, I think that's, that's a proof of the fact that all of them can do the same thing should they wish to. Which is why I, I thought of Krul as a Promethean figure. Mm. I mean, if you look at the Carcanus period, mm -hmm. the elder races, you know, the Jagad, the Four Krul Asail, the Azathanai, they, they have access to magic, but the other ones don't. Right. They know that the Tithes have the blood of chaos, and that's, that's actually quite an interesting uh, bit of information, but whatever chaos they have in their blood is so diluted, they cannot use magic. Mm. When Forge of, Forge of Darkness begins, the Tithes do not have access to magic. They gained access to, to magic through Krul's act of opening his veins, right? So I think he, he decided to temper that balance a little, to cut away from, to, to even the field, so to say. Mm -hmm. his, his act of opening magic to everybody is pretty much like Prometheus' act of stealing fire. Yeah. And just like Prometheus, there was a heavy price to pay. Yeah, in the case of the Tyst, uh, there's also a draconian influence there, which we haven't seen quite yet. I, think, I have a feeling we're going to see a lot more of that in, in Walk and Shadow. Um, but what you're saying is really cool, and it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I've looked at the Warrens as pockets that exist through cruel uh through his uh, his blood if you will um that it, but where do they exist they exist within chaos surround if you if you fall out of your war and you're gonna go in chaos surrounds all the warrens the elder ones and the the human ones all of them 
chaos surrounds them. So not, a, but not only is it the field uh, that surrounds all these different Warrens, I think it's probably the field from which they all come. And there's an imposition of order onto chaos, which is seen as threatening. Chaos is seen as, as, you know, as not evil, but, but as threatening, uh, you can become, if you get sucked into chaos, it's not good. You don't want to fall from your war and into chaos normally, because it'll, you'll fall apart and you'll, you'll be gone, you know? Uh, so there is something primal about it. Um, but it does seem to be, yeah, the energy from which uh, magic comes ultimately, doesn't it? Which makes well, a lot of sense. There's, there's a lot to this. Well, for one, at the time of the Carcanus, we have flavors of magic newly created through Cruel's blood. Uh -huh. But we don't have lands, geographical regions attached to these flavors. Mm -hmm. To put it this way, even in the Malazan time time timeline, you don't have, for example, a warren of the Nul. You can pull on the Nul, but there's no geographic land to walk through it, yeah. right? So if I was to hazard a guess, I would say that the war between the Thais was so devastating that they shattered Coral Ghelain. And then Krul used his blood and newly created warrens to impose one flavor on each and every shared piece of land. Mm. And I think that if he hadn't done that, they would have just been floating through chaos forever. That's why there's a thin border of chaos separating every Warren, because mm. he's chained them together, pretty much what he did to Jakuruku after uh, Kalor. Yeah. He did the same to the big world that was Kural Ghelain. Interesting. That's my guess. Yeah, because what he did, he sort of sealed off the destruction uh, of uh, Kalor's uh, empire into what would become the Imperial War, and I think right, um, exactly. which is still full of ash and dust and all kinds of <laughs> uh, unpleasantness. Not a nice place to hang out, really. <laughs> so. Interesting, Claudia. I, I really love what you're saying here about uh, the Warrens, and that does help, I think, make sense of them in some way. Do you, Have you been able to fit what the Azath are in all of this? Uh, sort of. Yeah, I also have a, a metaphor for that, and that's it's, it's fire. Uh -huh. Now, when you think of fire left by its own, it can be a destructive force. But if you give it a purpose, if you limit its power with a little bit of order, say you create a stove, a hearth, and you burn it within, and you don't let it expand, you control it a little, you know, impose a little order on the chaos of fire, then it's a life-saving force. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what the Azaths are. You know, when you have magic that goes out of, crazy out of, out of control, yeah. Well, you need a lot of magic to contain it. Yes. I mean, the only thing that can contain a whirlwind of magic is even more powerful magic. That or, you know, denial of magic, negation of magic, which is Otata Rao, but that's not readily available. And even that is not effective against everybody. So say you have a Tlani Mas that is, has gone crazy. How do you contain it? Well, a House of Azad will do that for you. Yeah. And with, that means that the houses of Azad are mostly chaos. And if you mm -hmm. think of Ikarium and the fact that he is infected with chaos, he destroyed the house of Azad. Right. And when it exploded, when it was dis destroyed, think of, you know, you kill somebody, you get splashed with blood. Mm. You kill a house of Azad, you get splashed with its own lifeblood. And that's chaos in this case. Interesting. Ah. So that explains Ikarium. Huh. I like it. I like it. So the, the Azath, I've always thought of, they're much more than just this, but I've always thought them uh, of them as kind of a safety catch uh, for <laughs> for too much magic. And, and so they have a natural instinct, I suppose you could call it, to swallow up anything that's really threatening. And so you have all these really super powered entities that tend to be hanging out inside the Azath. Uh, <laughs> in some cases waiting to get out too right yeah i believe those houses of ourselves are aware are, are self-aware they have they have there's, uh, there's no definitive proof of it in the books nobody knows but right. that's my personal belief 
or perhaps not, you know, aware the way, I don't know, a god would be, but the way a beast would be. Uh -huh. Some form of awareness for sure. Some kind of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. So, yeah, I love it. I mean, I absolutely love it. I, I do think that what you're saying as well would make sense um, to a Hindu uh, or to a Buddhist in, to a large degree too, because they have a tendency to understand, I think, more readily than those of us who grew up in a monotheistic tradition. They have a tendency to be more, I think, readily understanding that life and death are intimately really the same thing. They're, they're, they're aspects of one thing. And you can't have one without the other. You can't have life without death. You can't have order without chaos. They are, they are two sides of the same thing. Um, and, and what you're saying about chaos and magic and all of that, that I think would make sense to somebody in, 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 raised in one of those traditions. Do you agree with that? Do you think that would? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. And another thing I, I love about it is, is the subversion. I mean, we all tend to think of chaos as destructive, as evil, as the enemy, yes. yeah. right? And especially after Told the Hounds, where chaos is trying to consume all of creation, right. chaos is definitely the enemy. Right. But here in, in, in Dust of Dreams, Sam Chirac explains how chaos is magic and magic is life. All of life is magic. Yeah. And then the enemy of creation, the enemy of life is not chaos. Hmm. On the other hand, on, on, on the contrary, the enemy of life is the absence of magic. Hmm. Order and otataral, the absence and negation of magic, are the actual enemy of, of creation. And then he explains it quite beautifully. Don't think of it as enemy. Yeah. True, it seeks to destroy creation. In, in fact, creation is the result between the permanent war. Mm -hmm. Order trying to get imposed on chaos, chaos always being more powerful the result of it is creation is life mm. so he explains it how you know they're not enemy of each other for, for us they're not enemies no. they are necessary take any one of them out of the equation and creation is over too much chaos and it's done too much order and it's done yeah you have a balance like like in my soup metaphor yeah you have you need a certain quantity of water and a certain quantity of salt you don't want too, too much, much salt water, yeah. <laughs> Too much of any, and it's a problem. You cannot eat it anymore. That makes what's happening inside Dragnipur so interesting, right? Uh, and what Anno Manorik is up to, uh, it, that's, it's, it kind of puts a nice context to all of that and, and connects stuff going on as far back as Carcanus to what's happening in those, these, uh, especially later books of the Malazan Book of the Fallen. I love it, Claudia. Have you tried this theory out on Steven Erickson yet? No, not yet, but hopefully he'll see it. Okay. If he watches your video. If he watches this video, I hope he'll he'll uh, <laughs> maybe <laughs> at least uh, provide some kind of commentary or reach out to you, at least I hope, to to tell you what he thinks. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to reach out to him soon enough, I hope, because I'm I'm reading Memories of Ice and taking notes. And at the same time, I'm going through Dust of Dreams with my husband. Oh, nice. And it has given me a beautiful parallel between uh, Itkovian and Tanakalian. Both of them are shield anvils, but they're so different. Yes. Oh, yeah. They 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 embrace their role very differently, don't they? <laughs> and yeah. Getting to read them in parallel has been quite an experience. Yeah, I would imagine. Yeah. Cool. Wow, that is so cool. Uh, I love it. Um, and yeah, the, the gray swords are one of the interesting manifestations, I guess, of religion in, in the series, that's for sure. Um, Probably the most interesting because they represent not just modern nature, but a blend between modern nature and war. Yeah. Modern nature's hatred for us. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean... Is it hatred or is it indifference? And are we the, the dummies that put ourselves in opposition to nature? You know, in other words, through our hubris, through our arrogance, we put ourselves in, into positions where it feels like nature is opposing us, but really we're the ones who put ourselves there and nature is indifferent to us. Does that make sense? 
if we were talking about our world, yes. But I uh -huh. think it's different in the Malazan universe. Uh -huh. you, you have the Tlani, the, the Imas, the flesh and blood Imas, right. who have been, who have brought so many species to extinction. And then yeah. race after race after race have been Through doing their arrogance. Nature. It's very similar to human arrogance, I think. Right. in the Karkana's books, and then the Imas, flesh and blood creatures, and yeah. then humans, eons upon eons of the sentient bipedal life forms yeah. destroying nature. Yes. So they have come to a point where, and I, I came to this realization, I think just two, three weeks ago, huh. the very fact that on the beast throne in Memories of Ice, the empty beast throne, which is the throne of nature, yeah. has been taken by gods of war. Mm. You have two gods of war sitting on the throne of nature, mm. on the beast throne. So that tells us that nature is going to war with us, that it has had enough of what people have been doing. So I think it's, it's different in the Malazan universe. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting because we are currently in a time when we have record-breaking heat going on all over the world. And it feels like this whole environmental aspect of the Malazan is more relevant than ever um so yeah it, there's there's quite a lot in, in there um going all the way back to carcanus all the way through all the series there's a huge even in the the newer trilogy um there's some i think really cool interesting ways in which uh in in the god is not willing um you know ways in which we have some there's an environmental aspect to the story as well um so Wow. I mean, we, we are, you know, I think one of the beautiful things about Malazan is it does, I feel, reflect in some profound ways our place on this planet, on this, in this world, in this universe. Um, and that is something I deeply appreciate about the series. So, and all this stuff you're talking about really resonates with me a lot. Um, so very cool. I love your theories. And I will be very interested to hear uh, them confirmed. <laughs> Although you never know. I mean, authors are sometimes a little coy. And so we might not ever get confirmation, you know, uh, because yes. the author doesn't necessarily want to come down and say, yes, this is correct. And then it sort of has a way of stifling further discussion in a way. But, but, but I think you're right for what it's worth, Claudia. I think you're right. During my meeting in Opatia with Steven Erickson, he said something to me that probably he shouldn't have said, considering the way my my mind clicks when it comes to Malazan. Uh -huh. He said that people think of the Malazan universe as worlds, but they might someday discover the fact that, in fact, there is just one single big world. Interesting. Oh. And I think that's, that one single comment made my theory about uh, Coral Ghilane being destroyed literally shattered uh -huh. Uh -huh. and Cruel then using his newly made created flavors of magic to link them to to actual pieces of land wow yeah. because if, if you think of Leder the the throne of, of ice is there that's yeah. the, the Zaf that we see in the Karkana's books so how is that in the world of people Hmm. Unless this theory makes sense. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, we shall see. We shall see. I, I have a feeling a lot of questions are going to be answered with a walk in shadow. I'm hoping. I, so I'm really excited for that book uh, to be out. Uh, and I probably will reread uh, Forge of Darkness and Fall of Light. As soon as we start hearing some buzz about, yeah, it's going to be out on this date, or you know, because I don't think we know yet. Um, but I'm I, I don't know if this information is official yet. Uh, last year uh, we went and we we met Ericsson in France. Oh yes, we the, 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 the Ericsson and Esamont had their tour yes. in France. Nice. I was there, and Roxana was also there. We met there in a oh, How nice! Yeah. And he told her, I, I wasn't at that particular meeting, but he told her and she told me that there would be at least two more uh, books in the in the Carcana series, Walk in Shadow and one more. Oh, it's not a trilogy anymore then. No, I, I don't know if he made this 
information official though. Oh. He said it to her there at the, at the, at the you know table eating, sharing a drink. <laughs> she told me about it. I'm not sure if I should be saying it or not. It's, oh, I, don't know, maybe I mean, it, it's from the interview. I will treat it as rumor at the moment, but uh, I, I don't think Malazan fans would be upset if there were more Malazan books. So Malazan fans wouldn't, but I don't know about editors and publishers. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. They, yeah, that, that's a conversation that they'll take care of. Uh, but yay, more Malazan books. Hooray. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I have no insight into that whatsoever. Um, but I will not say no to more Malazan. So definitely more Carcanus. I love that series. I do too. I really do. Yeah. So Forge of Darkness. Let's talk about Forge of Darkness. Forge of the High so Mage. guys, if you've, you've read Malazan, but you haven't yet read Forge of Darkness, here's your the next Forge movie. of the High Mage, Philip. Oh yeah, sorry, Forge of the High Mage. <laughs> what am I saying? We were we were talking Carcanus, so it was on my mind. Uh, but Forge of the High Mage. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, so this is your warning, everybody. We're going to talk Forge of the High Mage by Ian Esselmont, the fourth book in the Paths to Ascendancy series. So if you haven't read it yet, uh, you might want to bail out. But thank you for being here up till now. So, Claudia, thoughts on Forge of the High Mage? Well, I would say that it is Esselmont's best book yet. Wow, that's high praise. Yeah. And I love them all. I do too. Yeah. It, it was a surprise for me because for a long time, the rumored title of the book was going to be The Gestal. Yes. And then he changed it to The High Mage. So I assumed it would be about Melikrel's rise to power, which in fact it is. But I think that The High Mage, the rise of The High Mage referred in the title is actually Tatran. Tatran, yeah. Where he gets forged in a way. Uh, <laughs> he becomes more than he was at the beginning of the book. Um, I find that the, this book to be fascinating for how my conception of Tayshran has... I mean, he did some of this in the earlier Paths to Ascendancy books as well. We got glimpses into Tayshran and, and how he is different, um, that he interacts with people differently, that he sees the world differently. So he has his own, uh, you know, uh, he, he's not necessarily the most gifted when it comes to people skills, right? Um, well, he reminds me a lot of me, so. I oh, interesting, interesting, yeah. I, if you just read Malaz and Book of the Fallen, you probably don't like Tayshrin very much. Um, but Esamont gives us I think, a fascinating uh, understanding of this character um, and uh, a much fuller picture of who he is and what makes him tick and, and how he got to be. What you see in, let's say, uh, although I will say initially in Gardens of the Moon, you think, whoa, Tayshran, not a good guy. And then later you kind of get glimpses in the last book and fall. But I think the most complete picture comes from reading Esalon's books. No, we, we don't get much of Tayshrin other than the fact that he's there. Yeah. He's this confusing enemy, not enemy in Gardens of the Moon. And then right. we have a meeting of him with Quick Ben in The Bone Hunters. Mm -hmm. And then I think in one it's of in the- in Disguise in, in Memories of Ice as well. Um, but yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then he's this absent figure that everybody's trying to contact, I think in Reaper's Gale, I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. But we, we don't get much of him, and definitely we don't get his point of view in in no. yeah. the series. I would think he's mainly Esteban's character. Everything we, we see about him from from the uh, novels to Path of Ascendancy, most of it is is from Esteban. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and he gives us a much fuller, I think, picture of this character who... Um... I have an affection for Tatrin from Esselmont's books. I, I think he's Definitely. a fascinating character who um, you see him really grow. He has some big growth moments in Forge of the High Mage, doesn't he? He he begins to realize that you don't have to be the most intellectual, most educated, best person in the world in order to have value. You know, mm -hmm. he, he looks at the soldiers at, at first as they're just vermin. 
Hmm. And then he realizes that vermin are not their mind and I'm going to protect them come what may. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That that bond between the soldiers who begin to follow Tashren and, and Tashren is one of the beautiful aspects of the book. Um, and I love that. I'm, I'm definitely here for it. Um, he's not the only character that we get insights into, though, is he? Male is... So my, I mean, I was so excited to see Mail in Forge of the High Mage, Were, weren't you? Yes, and it made me think, you know, in in um, Reaper's Guild, he gets trapped for a little while under that altar, and it was just after ah. Tehu had yeah. been attacked, and he gets trapped, and he just yells, "Not again!" And I was thinking, why not again? Interesting. And now seeing what happens in the forge of the high mage he has been trapped for thousands of years yeah yeah and he has at least hundreds his, yeah yeah thousands they yeah. said that the gestal you know the, the the first event described where the main island was submerged in the prologue yeah in the prologue there had been i don't know 1000 or 2000 years gone okay. from that yeah. to the current timeline yeah. so that's when they had him trapped yeah and he's been there for what 1000 2000 years yeah because he didn't want the gist all to be used that way. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because I think before we get to know him in the last book of the fall and where he's bug and he's so nice and he has this really wonderful bond with Tihol. There is a, a, an idea of, of that male was a bloodthirsty God and that there's this, this really you know, savage and, and kind of, uh, you know, people felt the need to propitiate because he is the god of the ocean, which can be incredibly destructive. And yet it is also that from which life comes, going back to chaos and, and all of that, right? Um, so, opposition. yeah, yeah. So the fact that he could embody those things, okay, makes a certain amount of sense. But here we get this view of him as he's, I love when Esselmont throws out these little, uh, cute little like when you hear how Kellen Ved got the name Kellen Ved and, and, and it just makes me crack up and Bug describes himself as oh I'm nothing I'm nobody just just like a little bug you know <laughs> it was just a, I, I could not help but that's kind of a nice dad joke in there thank you Esselmont <laughs> it was a confirmation I mean if you had any doubt that this is my own now you knew yeah yeah but he seems like he wants what he he wants to become what he is in uh in the Malazan series when we meet him in Midnight Tides. He's not quite bug yet, but he you can see that he wants to be that, right? In 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 this particular story. Well, I think he was trying to avoid giving up his identity, knowing that his hyperstress hates him to death. Yeah. So he had to make himself look harmless in order to avoid any suspicion yeah 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 but i love what he reveals about himself uh to uh what was her name the uh the high gianna. The gianna yes yeah gianna uh and how she uh has this relationship with man what she thinks of as male which is this figure uh, that is much more violent and uh, destructive and has been used. So it's interesting to see how we were talking about religion before and, and how it gets appropriated for a certain agenda on the part of some people who have power or are after power and how even the gist all becomes a tool that is used for things that it wasn't meant for. Um, and and how the people who took over Falar weren't the original inhabitants, weren't, weren't and and have taken what was theirs, appropriated it, and used it for destructive ends. No, no, there's a creepy detail in that scene where Gianna meets him for the first time, and he's skinny, and she says, "You know, if you're trapped here, how do you eat? How do you not die?" Yeah, and he says, "They feed me once a month." And we know that they practice human sacrifice. Mm. So once a month, they feed him blood, so just enough to keep him alive, yeah. but not so strong that he would escape. Yeah. And he kind of doesn't want to talk about his food and how it gets there. 
Yeah, he doesn't want to be sacrificed too in that way, I feel like. And that's why he stabs himself. And and it's as if he's sacrificing himself to himself in order to get out of there. You know, he has that little bead of blood that, that, that... he needs access to to the power in his blood. You know, Cruel has power in his blood, same does he, but he has no way to access it. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's magic in, in the knife itself. I it's agree. a sacrificial knife. I agree. And we see the same thing with the knife that he gives to Tavor. Mm, yeah, yeah. Good one. Good call. Nice connections you're making here. I like it. Yeah. What else in Forge of the High Mage did you want to discuss? Uh, were there other aspects there? Um, I mean, you do get some great interactions with Dancer and Kellen Ved and Kellen Ved becoming increasingly, I think, more a creature of shadow, but still some, still if there's some humanity in there somewhere. Whereas I, I, I think... <laughs> <laughs> I don't Whereas, think he had much of it to begin with, even when yeah, he was human. Fair enough, fair enough. Whereas Dancer, I feel like there's this constant conflict between the human in him and the the assassin, the enforcer, the figure where... And I, uh, AP made a great point when I was talking with him about this uh, book. Would Dan... And with a... Would Dancer have gone to intervene and save the leader of the Jek if it hadn't been Ulara? And the he answer is no, no, he would not have. But because he has this personal history with her, he goes and uh, and interferes in what Surly had arranged her death because she was seen as opposition, right? So Surly is making a tactical decision. We have to eliminate this leader uh, in order to assert ourselves over this territory, because they're an acquisitive empire, right? Dancer is put in this moment of conflict because he serves the empire too, but he knows this person. He has a connection to her. He, but he, he loves he her still in a way too, doesn't he? He also has a different solution to the conflict. It, it's not just interfering, intervening, for the sake of intervening, he says, well, why kill somebody who can be a powerful ally? So yeah. he, he he's able to only, rationalize it. Yeah, yeah. He not only saves somebody he loves, but he also offers a solution to the political problem. Yeah. Which would not have been available if there hadn't been a personal connection between them to begin with. True. Ulara might not have cared about Kelamved's trained dog if she hadn't known him. Yeah. Nor yeah. would she have trusted him? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. But it's fascinating to see his conflict um, already there. And it's something that gets, I think, worked a, a lot in the, in the last book of the Fallen. I'm thinking of his relationship with Sari, for example. And there's that beautiful scene. I think it's in the Bone Hunters when he and she had that discussion. Uh, do you remember the scene I'm talking about? Where it's on a ship, um, and Sari is there, and uh, Dancer appears, or Cotillion at this point, right? Appears, and he is such a sad god. <laughs> yes, he is. You don't know, often see a god. Male is another one, though. I think where the gods are are uh, sometimes they they feel bad about what humans do in the name of of the of the god, right? Uh, I think they all do. Yeah. I mean, even even the errand. There's a fragment in Reaper's Gale where he remembers why the the throne, the empty throne, is empty. Uh -huh. He said that they had been spilling so much blood in his name that he couldn't take it anymore. He stepped down his throne and he walked among people, trying to convince them not to perform human sacrifices anymore. And he says how they started hating him because he told them not to spill blood in his name. Wow. And that's why he chose not to return. He didn't want that sort of worship. I mean, we all look at the errand as being evil because, you know, he's fickle. He's... I mean, he does get some people we like killed, doesn't he? Uh, so. <laughs> he's definitely bitter after all of his days, but can you blame him? Yeah. E even cruel, he says, you know, they were spilling blood in my name, but I never asked for it. Interesting. Yeah. So looking at the god as cruel because. The god is what we made the god. Um, 
they're reflections of us in that sense, aren't they? Um, well, I liked the Worm of Autumn's reaction to re the way she reacted, or he reacted, because it's two in one package, to people trying to turn her position in the direction she didn't want to. You know, Cruel and Mael and the other, and they just said, well, this is this sucks, and they took it. Mm -hmm. She turned back and slaughtered all of the priesthood of her of her cult, rather than be forced to go in a direction she didn't want to go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, fascinating. Wow. Well, anything else from Forward to the High Mage that uh, you wanted to discuss? Uh, well, let me think. Well, there's lots Hesa of other aspects. And her team, Sorry? You know, Hessa and her team, the pirate captain. Oh, I poor think, Hessa. Yeah. Well, I didn't really feel for her, to be honest. No? I, don't know I felt why. bad for her fate. Her ultimate fate was... Oh, there was some... That I, I, I couldn't connect with her nor her crew. Oh, really? I huh. I, I felt that uh, she strove her best. She obviously cared about her crew and does some noble things. And, and uh, unfortunately, is way in over her head uh, the whole time. Um, and so I, I thought it was sad. I was a little sad when uh, she was killed by the uh, Chagall assassin is what does it, right? Yeah, she just no chance whatsoever against that thing. Even Dasim is like, whoa, you know, uh, he, he can't fight that thing either, really. Um, so that, that was sad. He did for a while. A bit, yeah. But he got he got cut up himself from the thing. So, yeah. That, I don't well, want to meet one of those. Shows. I don't want to meet one of those things. Yeah. <laughs> Nitro was awesome. And I think yes. that Nitro's Warren is the perfect indication of the fact that the as a night by default they draw on chaos uh -huh. they all wonder station in particular he wonders at the warren she pulls on and yeah. from the way he describes it it looks very much like chaos Interesting. It's, it's never disclosed it's never you know stated openly if it's not chaos it's certainly very close to it yeah interesting yeah and i love the role she plays in and she's somewhat torn about it because she's not really sure about this Tayshren guy, but she sees potential. some potential. Yeah, not only his potential for magic, which apparently is vast, but his potential for humanity, his 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 um, potential for kindness. For his, she sees a couple not, of moments there where he shows promise and says, "Yeah, maybe you're okay." He's not evil. He's just socially awkward, and because yeah. of that, he misunderstands people. Yes, yes. He doesn't get the cues that most of us would get. Um, and so he, I, I feel a kind of affection for him in, in those moments where he's kind of like, um, with um, one of the favorite, my favorite ones is when he's referring to, uh, oh, what's his name? The bald uh, mage. Hairlock. Hairlock. Thank you. When he's referring to Hairlock, and we all know what a unpleasant person Hairlock is. He's awful. And Tayshren is at one point, he's like, hmm, I think maybe Hairlock is not a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, yes, Tayshren, you got that. Yes. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, wonderful. This has been a ton of fun, Claudia. I'm glad we got a chance to to bond over Malazan and Forge of the High Mage and everything else. I think you have some brilliant theories there. Uh, so I don't know if we'll get the confirmation or not, but uh, hopefully uh, Mr. Erickson will at least hear what your theories are and uh, maybe we'll be nodding while he's he's uh watching i can we can imagine that at least right so Definitely. thank you so much for this uh everybody i will have of course a link to claudia's channel in the description and as we said in the beginning uh you probably don't want to watch all those brilliant interviews until you've read everything malazan so unless you're okay with spoilers and then that's fine uh, but uh thank you so much claudia for being here thank you for having me all right. Such a pleasure. All right, everybody. Thank you for watching and until next time.